and welcome to the St Andrews Wargaming uh, YouTube channel. Today I'm going to take a look at the analysis of the new FAQ 2 2018 that just dropped yesterday. Um, it's already causing quite a lot of discussion and controversy online and here are some of the thoughts that I've been having on it. First off, I'm going to look at the big FAQ 2 itself and then some of the changes to the rulebook, which has probably been the cause of the most controversy so far. And then I'm going to have a bit of a discussion at the end about how this affects my own armies and how my playstyle may change based on that. So first up, uh, Battle Brothers, Psychic Focus and the character targeting rules are now official and no longer beta. Um, I think that most players could see this coming, there was no big surprise. Even with the change to the Battle Brothers, um, Imperial armies are still incredibly strong and able to gain access to cheap brigades in the form of the Astra Militarum uh, Battalion for what's commonly called the Magic 32. For 32 models and just over 200 points, you get an extra 5 command points to your army. So this is still really strong for boosting other Imperial factions such as um, Adeptus Custodes, Imperial Knights, Blood Angels. So even with these changes, I don't think you're going to see a huge change to some of these armies. It still makes them incredibly strong. Not many changes for me here. Um, I don't tend to run mixed armies. I prefer playing pure faction. So the change to Battle Brothers really doesn't have an effect for me. Um, I don't tend to play smite heavy armies, so psychic focus has little effect as well. Um, as for the character targeting rules, I think they're a good change. Uh, they make it possible. One of the reasons they were raised was the uh, Calexus Assassin being used to essentially block attacks against characters because it can only be hit on a 6 and they were really hard to kill. So I think that's a good change overall. Another big change seen is the change to the tactical reserves rule. Um, this was an adaptation of the previous FAQ reserve rules and what it means now is that no units may arrive from reserve on turn one and this is quite a big change for many armies. Previously, as you'll know, uh, units couldn't be brought in from reserve on turn one outside your deployment zone but you could bring them in on turn one if you deployed them in your deployment zone. This has now changed and no units can come in from reserve on turn one. When I read this, what immediately sprung to my mind was no more using reserves to hide powerful enemy units such as Dark Reapers or Ravagers. What you could do would be to deploy these units in reserve and then depending on if you got the first turn or not, you could then deploy these units in your deployment zone on your first turn. Many of these uh, units, in the case of Dark Reapers or Ravengers, having such long range weaponry that it really didn't have much of an effect, especially in the case of Dark Reapers who always hit on a 3+. plus. So you were able to essentially move from deploying from reserve and still fire to full range and full effect with no penalty really. So it was essentially just a way of hiding your more powerful units in the Eldari army. Now you can still do this, you can still put the units in reserve to hide them, but you'll no longer be able to deploy them at all on turn one. So you either have to choose to deploy them on turn one where they will be potentially vulnerable, or you wait to turn two to use them and some armies, if you have a fast moving army or a large board coverage army, if you get first turn or even if you don't get first turn, you may be able to move and deploy in such a way as to block a lot of spaces where enemy reserves can come in now that they can no longer come in on turn one uh, on the deployment zone. So this is a big change. Another change which I thought a lot of people probably saw coming was they changed the restriction from half the power level to half the points level. Uh, I think most people saw this coming as, at least in my opinion or from my experience, very few players use power levels 
it's mostly points levels um, for games, as this takes into account the effects of war gear, chapter approved changes, etc. So I think most of us saw this coming. I don't think many of my armies are going to be that much affected by these. Certainly my White Scars and Death Watch, um, based on the stratagems and the units I have, more very few of my units were ever going into reserve anyway. For example, with my Death Watch and the Teleportarium, only a maximum of three units can go in. So this was really coming near half the points or power level of my army, so it won't be a big change there. However, one of my armies that will be seriously affected by this is the Gene Stealer Cults, and I think they've been the hardest hit by the new uh, change to reserve rules. Now, Games Workshop did say in the FAQ that Gene Stealer Cults are getting their own codex, which is going to address this, hopefully soon. I'm hoping to get that this year. But for the moment, until we get that new codex, no longer being able to arrive from Cult Ambush on Turn 1 is a big deal for the Gene Stealers. It was one of the few things they did have going for them in the Index. And I think having to wait to Turn 2 to bring in essentially the bulk of your reserves and powerful units in the Gene Stealer Cults, they're, they're really a melee heavy army. They don't have enough shooting potential to be able to sit back. They have to be in at the heart of the enemy doing damage. They really don't have a huge number of durable units that can essentially hold out for two tons of the enemy shooting and assault. Um, the neophytes are pretty much poorer guardsmen. They do have some tough vehicles, but not impossible for a lot of armies to take out. So I think there'll be a, a bit of hiding for the Gene Stealer Cults from now on. So in the next few months, hopefully the Codex will come out this year. But in the next few months, um, it's going to be tough going for the Gene Stealer Cults. The change from power level to points won't have too much of an effect, I think. In a recent game, the units I had in reserve, the power level was roughly half the army and the points level I calculated was about the same. So I don't think that will have much of an effect, but the, the losing the turn one ambush certainly hurt them hard. The next thing that I want to talk about is the new beta rules. Uh, the first one called prepared positions has been introduced. So what this is, is you use the stratagem at your first battle round before the first turn begins for two command points. Until the end of the first turn, all units wholly within your deployment zone, other than Titanic, get a cover save. Even if they're not on a terrain feature. And there's no stacking here, so if you're in cover, you don't get an additional bonus. For me, I think this is quite an elegant way of mitigating the effects of going second in the game. As in most editions of the game so far, going first in 8th edition is still a big deal. Uh, the firepower and the damage output of a lot of armies is really strong in 8th edition. So having to weather the enemy shooting phase for the first turn is a big deal. Um, this is quite, for me, for only two command points, this is pretty good getting the whole army in cover, affecting infantry and vehicles and all units in your deployment zone. Uh, most marine armies will be going up to a 2 plus save on the first turn, and that can be pretty good. Uh, it will also help out some vehicles, giving most a uh, 4-up armor save against missile launcher type weapons, so AP-2, 5-up save against LAS cannon, and even a save against Melta weapons on turn 1. It's only 6-up, but it might come up every once in a while. I think this will also have an impact on deployment, as there'll be times when you can deploy more aggressively, or in a more optimal position for grabbing objectives or going after the enemy units without having to worry about staying in cover, thanks to the new stratagem. A lot of the times you will want to keep your units out of line of sight simply to save them from being shot at all, but in some ways getting a 2 up plus save on turn 1 will help a lot of armies against um, small arms fire or for getting into position. It also gives a slight boost to those armies that ignore cover saves um, through a chapter tactic, such as the Iron Fists or Crimson Fists. 
Not one of the strongest Space Marine strat, um, not strategy, I'm sorry, not one of the strangest, uh, strongest Space Marine chapter tactics, but it gets a slight boost now in that your opponent can't use this. Um, I will be looking forward to see how this affects games, whether it's going to be worth two command points in most instances, or whether you're going to be deploying in cover anyway to make effect uh, of it during more of the game as opposed to deploying the open, but I think it could be useful every once in a while. The other beta rule, which I think a lot of people were expecting, was a change to command point regeneration, and this is called tactical restraint. And what it essentially means is that you can only regain a single command point per battle round, regardless of which ability you're using. There's abilities, there's warlord traits and relics that can allow you to regain command points, mostly on a 5 or 6 plus. Um, and this has been limited to once per battle round. I think most opponents of Astra Militarum or Imperial armies will be a bit relieved about this, as it was ridiculous how many command points certain armies could regenerate in a single turn. Um, they were essentially getting infinite command points. Um, and I've certainly played games against Astro Militarum bat Battalions or um, Brigades where they were starting with 20 command points and they were using 30 or 40 over the course of the game. Um, and it made them incredibly strong. I think another benefit of this rules change is that you might actually see other warlord traits or relics being taken. For most armies that had access to some form of command point regeneration warlord trait or ability, this was the only one that you would see used in games. For example, for the Astra Militarum, you pretty much exclusively saw Grand Strategist giving you command points back for each command point used on a 5 plus and Kurov's Aquila which allowed you to do a similar ability whenever your opponent used a stratagem. In Astra Militarum armies and in mixed Imperial armies these were pretty much the only warlord trait and relic you saw um, for the Astra Militarum. Now you may actually see some variety in these armies. While getting the command point back is still strong, it is limited to once per turn, so only four or five potentially over the course of a single game, which is still a big boost. An extra five command points in a game is still strong and allows you to use a lot of stratagems. But for other armies, particularly my Dark Angels or my Death Watch, I may actually experiment with other types of warlord trait to boost my warlord or to boost nearby units. Uh, one thing I don't think this ruling or this beta rule will do is change the use of the guard battalion. Um, this is one of the cheapest ways to get an extra five command points in an army for only just over 200 points for a minimum size battalion you can get three 10-man infantry squads and two company commanders. Um, this provides some nice screening unit, some decent firepower if you take heavy or special weapons on the squads combined with the orders of the company commanders. And getting, with the reduction in command point regeneration, an extra five command points on an army is still going to be a big boost and allow you to use more. So this is still going to... You won't be generating a crazy amount of command points anymore, but it's still going to help out mixed Imperial armies over those without access to such cheap battalions. Another change involves some of the stratagems. Some of the more powerful stratagems in the game have seen an increase in the number of command points required to use them, or a change to their core rules. For example, the stratagems strike from the shadow, forward operatives, clandestine infiltration, these were common in a number of armies throughout the game and they essentially functioned in the same way. This allowed you to place generally an infantry unit. You could deploy them on the board um, before the first turn started 
anywhere on the board at least nine inches from an enemy unit or the enemy deployment zone. What made these stratagems different were there, where there was no restriction on moving in the first turn or charging in the first turn. So if you use these stratagems to put generally one to three units, it was almost always three units, deploy them nine inches away from the enemy deployment zone or enemy units if they'd screening units, such as scouts or nurglings. If you got the first turn, you could move these units up six inches and that would give you a three inch charge unless your opponent was deploying very deep in the deployment zone in which case you're already getting a bonus as you're reducing their board coverage. You were pretty much getting a guaranteed charge. It was a three inch charge. Um, and this meant you were getting a lot of first turn charges or first turn units in melter range. For example, I've played this before. We're using the um, Alpha Legion stratagem forward operatives. My opponent was able to put three big units of Corn Berserkers in reserve. And they essentially all charged my army on turn one um, and were able to do a lot of damage. The way this has now changed is that it now gives you a nine inch move before the start of the battle, uh, first battle round, as long as you still remain at least nine inches away from an enemy unit. What this means is that you are no longer deploying anywhere on the board. You can only move nine inches from your starting uh, position. I think this is a big impact on units such as Raven Guard or Alpha Legion. Um, in my opinion, it was certainly way too powerful beforehand. Perhaps if they weren't allowed to move in the first turn, it might have been a bit more balanced then you're still looking at a 9-inch charge or you are perhaps not in rapid-fire range or melter gun range of the unit you want, but with no restriction on moving after deployment, it was very powered. It was very overpowered, in my opinion at least, that this was a... With certain units, this was a really strong ability. Perhaps more for the Chaos units than for the Raven Guard, um, but it was still very strong. However, I do think a lot of players will be annoyed with this because it's one of the key defining features of the army and has essentially shut it down. Now, Raven Guard still get a very strong chapter tactic, the minus one to hit over 12 inches away, and I believe it's the same for Alpha Legion. So that is still a very strong army for the Space Marines to use, but less so now that you can't use this ability. Um, it was good for getting high firepower units in close to the enemy army um, and for good assault units. So I think it's a good change overall, but I can understand why a lot of players will be upset. The other thing that has happened is that some of the command point costs have gone up. A lot of these were focused on the Imperial Knights and the Blood Angels and some for the Drakari. Certainly the Knights got a lot more. One of them that went up was the Oathbreaker Guidance System, went up to three command points. Again, I think this is a good choice as this was a really powerful stratagem. It essentially allowed you to target an enemy character that was, as long as they were on the board, you could target them if they were out of line of sight. It ignored invulnerable saves. It pretty much ignored most armor saves due to its AP value and it did D6 damage. So it was possible to kill off most characters in a single go, although realistically it took a couple of the missiles with average rolling, um, even for a, a weaker character. Um, it did make it, unless your model was off the board on a transport, it made them impossible to hide. So this was a really powerful stratagem to use for only two command points. Another stratagem that also went up in cost was the House Raven stratagem Order of Companions has now gone from two command points to three command points. This again allowed a House Raven model to reroll any rolls of one for the remainder of the shooting phase. This included to hit rolls, to wound rolls, damage rolls, rolls for number of shots. 
basically any role in the shooting phase. And this was an incredibly strong ability. Um, even for two command points, this was pretty powerful um, and was, uh, I think, quite rightly increased. Um, another stratagem that's gone up is our Darkest Hour. So this was used on House Tyrannus Knight models. When the model is reduced to zero wounds but doesn't explode, on a four up, it gets up again at the end of the phase with D3 wounds remaining. Um, again, this was very strong, meaning it was difficult for your... Once your opponent had finally managed to take down a knight, it could just get back up and there was potentially ways to heal them with some allies or to have them fighting at full effect with machine spirit resurgence or other such abilities. And this was an incredibly strong ability, which I think again deserved to go up in points. The other one that went up was Agents of Vect. Now for me, this is one of the most powerful stratagems in the game in that it denies your opponent the use of their other stratagems. Um, it was already expensive at three command points. I'm not sure it needed to go up to four. Um, with the change to command point regeneration, a standard two battalion army is only going to get 13 command points. Um, so you could only... You could use this three or four times with other stratagems in a normal game. Now... With Agent of going up to four command points, you're going to potentially be spending more. Um, you're only going to be able to use it two or three times, especially if you're using other stratagems like lightning fast reflexes to keep your unit safe or the new cover stratagem to keep your army safe for turn one. Sometimes this stratagem could even cost five points as it only works on a two plus. So if you do spend it and you roll that one, you're going to want to use a command point reroll to block it so there's a potential cost of five command points here for the stratagem which is pretty expensive i i didn't come up against it too often although often enough that it was annoying but a lot of my armies don't rely on a single stratagem to be effective well that's not true the the genes of the cult certainly need meticulous uprising if that had been blocked that's pretty powerful but many of the other ones um do have an effect on it so i can see why it's gone up i think that's going to be interesting um to see how that affects the game because i think three command points was already pretty expensive for that even though it was one of the best in the game so now i'll move on to what's probably one of the biggest controversies and talking point about this faq and that is the new rulebook errata for units with fly. Fly now only allows models to ignore intervening terrain and models when they move in the movement phase. Previously, this applied to the assault phase or essentially whenever the model moved at all. This means that units with fly can no longer charge over screening models to get to more valuable units behind them in the charge phase. They either have to go around them, which in many cases will make it a much larger charge or in many cases an impossible charge to perform. Uh, this is a big hit for me for jump pack units and the, the so-called smash captain type models. It's also a huge blow for Harlequin units who have had their uh, foot belts FAQ'd to remove the ability to do this outside the movement phase. Um, one of the key defining features of the Harlequin was essentially leaping over anything they wanted to, assaulting behind units um, to get to more valuable characters or vehicles. Um, I still think they're strong because they can move over them in the movement phase. They still get to fall back and shoot and charge, but it's certainly a big blow. I can sort of understand how this change was made. It can be really annoying to set up your units tactically um, to screen and then it's just completely undone, especially when it's compounded by the 3D6 charge type stratagems, which made it relatively easy to deploy a jump unit from reserve 
and still get a charge in over a screening unit to a further away enemy unit. So I can see the annoyance of why it's changed. It's also going to make units in ruins a lot more difficult to shift. Um, before you could bring in a jump pack unit from reserve 9 inches away from the unit and only have to make a 9 inch charge um, potentially to get to them. Now that you can ignore the distance on the charge phase, it could potentially make these units a lot harder to get to. It could make a charge impossible on a second or third level of a ruins. So I think it's going to hurt a lot of fly units and it's a shame that this change has essentially come about because of the, the Blood Angel Smash Captain or those types of captains, uh, characters with the jump ability. It's a shame that a lot of assault units and units with fly have been hurt. Um, units like Assault Marines, other such a skimmer units have been hurt by this, but it'll be interesting to see how this changes and whether it stays um, or whether it gets revoked. The other thing about the FAQ was the clarification of heroic intervention. You can perform a heroic intervention in your opponent's turn, even if they didn't charge, and you cannot perform a heroic intervention in your own turn. In all honesty, um, before I heard about big upsets at recent tournaments, I had never even considered that you could perform a heroic intervention in your, own, in your opponent's turn if they hadn't charged. I figured that this rule was to allow characters to get into combat to help out a nearby friendly unit if they were charged. I never thought it could be used to essentially get your character into combat if an enemy unit hadn't charged if you were simply near them. However, after reading the rules, um, there's nothing in the wording that would stop you doing this, and it turns out that this was the intention of the game's designers all along. It does seem a bit weird and a bit counterintuitive, but I guess that's the way they want to go. Um, this means that units like Character Knights, I think this is where the, the big talking point came from with Heroic Intervention, was people using units to screen knights and stop them moving forward and then being charged by them in their opponent's phase because they were characters and could undergo heroic intervention. It's also going to make Space Wolf characters pretty powerful as they get a 6 inch heroic intervention um, so you're going to have to stay quite far away from them in your turn if you don't want them charging in at you and doing some damage so it's certainly going to be something to bear in mind from now on with uh, how your army is going to perform. So looking at my own armies, um, there are going to be some changes to the way I play them in my playstyle. First up, the Death Watch. They got an FAQ about targeting stra scramblers. So this stratagem allows you to remove Tau marker lights from a unit. They've had marker lights placed on them. It's now used to remove marker lights after a unit's shooting has finished. Um, this was to essentially stop a situation where a unit could get hit with marker lights and then you immediately had to play a stratagem to remove them. But the Tau player could then play another stratagem immediately to put additional marker lights on the unit and additional D3 marker lights. The way the rules work, when both rules are used immediately after an action, so for example, immediately after being hit with a marker light, then uh, the player whose turn it was chooses the order of operation. So obviously the Tau player was going to hit a Death Watch unit with a marker light. The Death Watch player was then going to play the stratagem to remove the marker lights immediately after being hit. The Tau player could then play his stratagem, which was also immediately, and he could choose the order of operation, to put an additional D3, units, uh, D3 marker lights on the unit. So that essentially wasted the Death Watch stratagem. You did get to remove some of the marker lights, but not all of them. I think this is a good fix. I think this was the intention of the stratagem, was to get rid of all marker lights on the unit. So I, I, I mean, obviously as a Death Watch player, I like this, but I think it was the intention. The change to the reserved rules might affect them a little. 
Um, it's quite common. I will generally put the maximum three units in reserve using the teleportarium stratagem. Uh, most of the time, these were deployed on turn two in anywhere on the board um, to make use of getting into rapid fire range with the special issue ammunition and with the watchmaster helping them. However, there were a few games where I decided to deploy them on turn one in my deployment zone. Either if my opponent was playing quite aggressively or there were units I had to deal with. So it didn't come up too often, but it may affect me um, when I would want to use it. So I may have to think more carefully about what units are going to go into reserve and why. For my Space Marines, for my White Scars army, and, and certainly for my Dark Angels, it was clarified that you cannot use an Apothecary to bring back an Armorium Cherub and a Devastator Squad back from the dead. Again, for me, this was a strategy I hadn't even considered. Um, I guess according to the rules, there was nothing against it, but it didn't seem that you could do this, to me at least. This was the same as the last FAQ when I read about using the Armorium Cherub with Hellfire Shells. Again, it was a tactic that I hadn't even considered, but now I use all the time since it was clarified in the FAQ um, that you can use the Hellfire Shells stratagem on a Heavy Bolter, which if you hit, does D3 mortal wounds to an enemy unit. You can then use the Armorium Cherub to fire again with the Heavy Bolter, and you can still use the stratagem in effect. So you're essentially doing 2D3 mortal wounds for one command point, which is an incredibly strong ability, um, and something I hadn't even considered before the FAQ, but now gave me a brand new tactic, which was quite nice. The change to command point regeneration won't affect my White Scars, um, as they didn't have access to this Warlord trait anyway, that was Ultramarines only, so that's going to have no effect. The change to fly rules might affect some of my jump pack characters and assault squads, but generally I was using my assault squads to deliver plasma pistols to vulnerable enemy units or characters, so it really is not going to have much effect. For the Astra Militarum army, um, one of the biggest changes was to Bulgrin Slab Shields, which now specifies that they only increase the armor save by 2. Previously the wording was that the save of the model was increased by 2, and this also applied to the invulnerable save on the Bulgrins. So with psychic powers and stratagems, it was possible to get a 2 plus invulnerable save on a unit of Bulgrins with relative ease, uh, making this really already quite tough unit practically in indestructible against most armies. Um, I don't think that was ever the intention of it. I think this was way too powerful, so I do like this change. Doesn't help that I don't have any Bilgrins in my arm at all, so it really doesn't affect me. Also, the take cover stratagem was specified to now only affect armor saves and infantry rather than all saves. So that's another change where you can't boost the invulnerable saves of, for example, the Bilgrins anymore. And again, I think this was the intended change um, what this will also do is, if combined with the new cover stratagem, will actually give Guardsmen one selected infantry squad a 3-up armor save on turn 1 if they're in the deployment zone, um, which is a pretty good bonus, actually. If, you, if you're finding one unit being targeted, um, certainly a unit of conscripts, a big unit of conscripts will now be able to get a 3-up save with relative ease on turn one, um, which is a nice boost for them. And these big units are already pretty hard to get rid of with firepower, so that will be a huge bonus to them. One of my final armies, which will be affected a bit, is the Gene Stealer Cults. Uh, as I discussed previously, the change to the reserve rules and no longer being able to deploy with Cult Ambush on turn one is a big hit for them but hopefully we'll be getting some redress in an upcoming codex um, to balance this, to either allow them to do it again or to change their rules in some fashion that they can still have an impact on turn one. 
Another clarification was the use of Return to the Shadows. So this stratagem allowed you to remove a unit from the board as long as they weren't within 6 inches of the enemy and deploy them on the following turn using the Cult Ambush stratagem. Uh, what they clarified was that using this stratagem after turn 3 or in turn 3 or after doesn't automatically destroy your unit. Rules as written, you couldn't bring units from reserve after turn 3 or they were destroyed. The way this worked, if you used this stratagem after turn 2, you were essentially killing off your own unit. As you would remove them from the board, you would deploy them, and you couldn't deploy them after turn 3. I think this is good. I think this was the intention of the rule. I don't think it was a stratagem that was impossible to use after turn 2 or to suicide one of your own units. Um, by removing them from play, so I think this is a, a good change and a good clarification that was needed. Although I always played it this way anyway, just explained it to my opponent. Most opponents in a casual setting were fine with that, um, understanding that that was probably the intention of the rule. So, overall, um, a lot of big changes to the game with the FAQ and Arata. I think most people saw the command point abilities being reined in and changing. I still think mixed Imperial armies are going to be very strong. They were certainly the biggest beneficiary of the command point farming rules, and it was a bit overpowered for some of them. But mixed Imperial armies are still a very strong army. Um, they can take cheap guard battalions to get more command points. And they have access to some of the best units and combos in the game. The change to the fly rule did catch me by surprise. Um, I did not see that one coming. And I think it's going to... It certainly seems to be at the moment one of the most controversial changes to come out of the FAQ. And is going to be interesting to see how players can adapt to that and if they can. Based on these, I do look forward to seeing how it's going to impact the game going forward. And I am looking forward to Chapter Proof 2019 to see what happens. Maybe my Gene Steel Occults might get a few points reductions to make them a bit better or some new stratagems. Um, I'm also looking forward, hopefully we'll get some new missions. I would really like to see some new Maelstrom missions as these are one of my favourite ways to play the game. And it would be nice to have some more to try. So, um, what were your thoughts on the new FAQ? Has it completely destroyed your army? Or are you looking forward to trying them out? Um, comment below on what you think of my thoughts on the FAQ and, and what your thoughts are and how it's affected you. And as always, if you like the video and the battle reports, please subscribe to the channel and you can find the St. Andrew's Wargaming Facebook link as well below. So, thanks again.